Okay, welcome back. Um, we were looking at uh, influencing skills. We looked at one, which is confrontation. We looked at an example. We were talking about how um, uh, influencing skills help to motivate change and bring about uh, the, the next level to move into, to propel change in uh, counseling. Okay, so we, we saw what influencing skills was. Let's look further. Let's look into the second one. The second type of influencing skill is what we call as focusing, the skill of focusing. Now, focusing, what does it enable a counselor to do? To direct the counselee's conversation into specific areas. So you're directing the focus of your counselee to another area, helping them to bring about a new perspective towards maybe a certain story that they have. So you, it, it's a sense of a redirection, so, uh, something that you would want um, uh, to help them to focus on. Like, for example, when you've noticed that a counselee has mentioned very little about their family, the counselor uh, may believe that you know there is some relevance about their family and believing that, that there is something relevant about the contribution of the family to the entire situation may direct the conversation towards the counselee's family. OK, uh, we we'll, we'll look at an example. Um, yeah, let's look at an example here. The counselee is saying, I'm wondering how I will manage my finance. Many bills uh, to be paid, kids tuition fees, house maintenance, and much more. So the counselor says, you're worried about the many responsibilities you have financially. Uh, she says, yes. A counselor says, often the amount and the way we spend our money can give us a good idea on how we can manage finances. What are the other things you like to spend on? So here, um, what the counselor is, trying, counselor is trying to do is to really get her to focus on some aspect of the finance, on how she may be spending on other things to, to really focus on that. So that's what the counselor says. The amount and the way we spend our money can give us a good idea how we generally man manage it. So what are the other things? So it, it, gets, it, it gets pushed to thinking or to discussing something else that may require the relevance uh, at that at that point. OK, so that second part is um, uh, focusing. The next one is interpretation or reframing. Now, this again is a, a, a skill that is very often used uh, in, in the influencing. Now, what are you doing through interpretation or reframing? Your, your counselee is encouraged to see their experience in a different way or maybe in a more positive fashion. So the counsellor is encouraging the shift by offering alternate views or way of viewing their experience. So the objective is to help your counsellee to build a, a positive perspective towards a problem so that they can take effective action. It, it's invol it involves using a different frame of reference towards a problem. So looking at it from another lens, or looking like, for example, you, know, you would have all known the example of the glass half full or the glass half empty. right? So it really depends on your perception or the way that you look at a certain problem. The more lack that you see, the more the bigger the problem appears. The uh, maybe on the other hand, the more blessing that you can see, the smaller the problem looks. So that's basically what you are attempting to do: to be able to help the counselee work through, uh, um, to to look at it through a different perspective. So let's look at an example. Okay, the the example here is uh, let's let's look at maybe it's a, a counselee. Uh, who is upset about having to move away from their home. Uh, and, and maybe they're likely focusing on the loss of the support network that they have and maybe the familiarity of the people. So what is the counselor doing here is they're acknowledging the counselee's loss, but is reframing the event to be perceived as an opportunity to experience maybe new places or uh, new situations, right? So here, if you look at it, 
the council is saying, moving away from home has made me miserable. I miss my family, my friends, and everything that was so familiar. So the counselor says, you feel unhappy that you've left behind all your loved ones and everything that was familiar through this move. What good do you see through this although? So you see, the, the, the perspective is, is changing. That's what you are attempting to do. You, you've moved the lens. And she continues to say, I don't know. Everything is so new. So the counselor again says, being in new situations can be quite stressful, isn't it? But there is an interpretation that's given. However, it can be an opportunity to experience new people and places too. What do you think? Right? So there is, there's been a, 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 a different frame to look at it. So it, what is it encouraging them to do? To look at the life situation from an alternative frame of reference. The strategy uh, may not change the facts of the situation. And neither are you trivializing the pain or the hurt that uh, your counselee is going through. But you are helping them to find a new meaning to this, Okay, uh, to, to reframe or to see it in a different way. So that's what reframing is. And this is your influencing. You're bringing them to a place of change to be able to look at look at their situation a little bit more positively. OK? Uh, the next one is what we look at is logical consequences. Now, logical consequences, um, uh, it, what does it do? It enables the counselee to, to see the outcomes of a different action or of alternate actions, thus also looking at positive possibilities and concentrating on achieving those. So those counselees who have unrealistic expectations about the consequences uh, of following the goals are more likely to be non-compliant. But counselors need to share and tell the clients what to expect as a result of both the directives, either when you follow something or when you don't follow something. So here, you're helping them to think about what could happen if they take an alternate action or if they continue to stay in that action. So let's look at an, look at an example. OK, now this is uh, about a counselee who is considering taking medication or uh, for, for, for their depression. So the counselor is saying, what are your expectations regarding the medication that is given to you for depression? So the counselor says, I guess with the medication, I should feel better in a few days and have them taken off. So um, uh, th there is this probably an unrealistic expectation here that you know I can take it for a few days, and then I should just take them off. So the counselor says, actually, so there's, there's an information given here. Actually, the first few weeks, you may really not experience much change. It may take a month or more to see, see the real effects of the medicine. So there is some kind of a, um, uh, uh, information that's given. And here the counselor says, oh, that's disappointing. So they may have thought that, you know, just take it for a week. So the counselor says, you really wish it would work quick. However, it would be necessary to keep a constant follow-up with the doctor. So basically, what you're doing here is to present the consequences to them. Like, uh, and uh, here, I, I see that this, these kind of examples happen more when counselees need to make a choice. Like, for example, uh, you know, when they come up with some kind of addictions, right? And then they say, you know, that there isn't any problem in my life. I don't. I don't think I should give up drinking completely. Um, yeah, once in a while, maybe, yes, I, I just want to stop for some time, but then I would like to continue. So you, you may face these kind of uh, situations. And that's where these logical consequences are good. So that's where you could probably say, uh, you know, bring about uh, um, maybe a statement such as, um, you know, you, you were really, I, I see that you're really hoping to continue uh, with the drinking for some time because you feel it doesn't impact your life as much. Then you focus them. Here I'll be doing two things. I'll be reframing. Uh, I'll be focusing uh, differently. I'll say, I'd like you to look at your work and tell me how has your um, drinking habit affected your work or what has been certain areas in your work that you see 
has uh, has had a has had an issue so what are you doing you're letting them know that okay you may be okay here in your family that no one's saying anything but how is it helping you uh, or how does it affect you in your work so you're actually helping them see the consequences of what can happen and sometimes a lot of this can just be done by questions by saying okay how does this how do you think your this will affect this area of your life or what what would your now, what would it mean in in a in a in another uh, sphere of your existence? So to help them to understand those consequences. So when you're doing this, when you're bringing it up in the form of uh, questions that help them see those consequences, maybe they're in a better place to take a better decision on how they want to move that forward. Okay. The next type is what we call as self-disclosure. Now, self-disclosure, it's, um, uh, it's, it's the intentional disclosing of the counselor's personal information. And you're doing this not because, um, not because you, know, you want to share something about your life story only. It is as part of your effort to, one, connect with your counseling as well as to bring about maybe some kind of motivation to help them see one that they're not alone that uh, that you know that there is some way that even you may have gone through something and you figured out a way so it involves you disclosing the counselor disclosing some personal information which is relevant or supportive to the client's process of decision making so it's it, like, I, like it's written here, it's used as a factor of motivation, which helps them to concentrate on the more beneficial effects of that situation. And it also, <clears throat> it does create that sense of trust and rapport in the, in the relationship in itself. So when you are using self-disclosure, you've got to be careful uh, to uh, the way that you use it. So you use self-disclosure to create a more trusting relationship or to model some appropriate behaving or to increase um, uh, that, that, that sense of connection between you and your counselee or to influence change, right? So you've got to be very intentional. You've got to be simple, be very concise and simple. Share only what is necessary. You don't have to say an entire story but share only that which is necessary to achieve that goal okay you may uh, you need to stay parallel that is you know only to the issue that that you want uh, that is relevant to your counseling you do not lie you don't you shouldn't be fabricating stories you should time it correctly and not overburden them and disclose too frequently it's not something that you would um do very regularly but uh, it is to uh, it, it is done basically sometimes to build a good rapport uh, and and you need to have a good rapport before you disclose anything right if, if it is done too early uh, it may almost seem that you are unburdening yourself on on the council okay and again yeah to, to be able to talk about issues that are related directly to their situation so let's look at an example here the example is uh, here the counselor is saying, I know how hard it is to be consistent about disciplining the children. I struggled with correcting the behavior of my children too for a while, a few years ago. Often it just feels like it's more work and effort, but at the end, I have seen that it has paid off being consistent. So she's not giving many details about what, but just saying that, okay, I've also had the challenge of disciplining children and I've just seen that over the years, it's important to be consistent. So the client, the counselor says, oh, I can't imagine you have problems managing your children. Right. So the counselor says, I take that as a compliment, but it's been a learning experience for me, too. So it actually helps to show your counselee that uh, that you're human, that you also go through struggles, that you also have to work hard, that you also have to do something to change your situation. So in some of those uh, things uh, it it actually also helps. Okay, the next one we're going through is feedback. Feedback is um, 
uh, what does it do? It, it, it is about giving information, objective information about maybe how, um, how your counselee is responding or how they are improving or where they are at, at, that, at that time. It differs from other skills like paraphrasing or summarizing in that the information that you give is a feedback to the, the counselee. It isn't about the content but it is about their behavior or it is about themselves. So it's it, what you're describing is how they act and appear to others when they're telling their stories. So it's a powerful technique that you can use when, you know, when actually counselors hear things about themselves, they are able to see the way that others perceive them, okay, which they may have considered or may not have considered. Now, it, when you're doing feedback, it should, um, it should concentrate on the positive aspects of the individual and how the, you can explore even better possibilities for greater improvement. It, it's not something that you would give as a negative feedback, right? That uh, like, like maybe you're saying, you know, you're so, you're so jittery or you're so anxious or you seem to be very, uh, very scattered. You know, you, you don't have a time time schedule so that kind of a feedback can actually feel feel very very judgmental but then when you are seeing some form of an of an improvement it it actually helps to boost your counselor so let's look at an example the counselor is saying i'm wondering if you have noticed that each time we have discussed the children your eyes have filled up would you explain to me what you're going through so here it's it's a notice. You're noticing something about them, giving them a feedback, probably, uh, you know, helping them to talk about something that may be sensitive. So so the counselor says, or over the past uh, uh, attempts, uh, sessions, you seem to have made efforts to stick to the schedule you have prepared. The progress you are seeing could be related to that. That's a job well done. So here there is a there is a sense of encouragement. The other one is a different kind of a feedback, helping them to explore some part of uh, their lives which have not been explored up until now okay the next influencing skill is to provide information and broad suggestions now this is something you can introduce to a counselee it's an information giving that involves uh, giving them uh, some factual information that can help them in some way maybe uh, you know some some support that they would require so sometimes counselees are not sure where they need to start looking for, for information. So counselors can help their uh, counselees to find that uh, starting point. So when you're giving information, you're only giving relevant data or facts that is needed for them. Okay, You're also ensuring that they may be receptive to the information. Like, for example, you may be, um, you know, you would you feel that you're uh, counselee needs a health checkup or may may require some kind of physical um uh, you know physical some regime either a checkup or a, some kind of an exercise to help them so you you need to ensure that they are receptive to the information right you don't give in all the details and then finally them saying no i don't think i should be doing it that doesn't work right so you have to bring them to a place of personalizing say okay i need to do something about this you also need to be direct be clear be specific be concise be concrete about what you're giving them so here is here's an example uh, the counselor uh, the counselee says i have been wanting to know all the investment plans available in a bank but i'm afraid i really don't understand some of those terms so here the counselor is saying, yes, with all those jargons, it can be very unfamiliar. Maybe a good person to approach is a bank manager. So here you're giving certain uh, certain details or certain certain things that is necessary necessary for them. Okay. So remember that influencing skills are used in degrees depending upon the approach of the counselor as well as your personal framework. So depending on how um, what kind of an approach you use in the way you work with a counselee is is uh, is what is beneficial. Okay, let's do maybe one or two uh, exercises. So let's just see if we can work through this. Okay, 
So here's the counselee saying, I know I generally feel better after the medical procedure, but visiting a doctor is so frightening. Those needles, the smell, and the entire environment can be very daunting. OK, so could one of you like <coughs> to use any of these influencing skills, either interpretation or reframing? That is to help them see the more positive part of it or logical consequences. Would any of you like to try? Anybody likes to try? <clears throat> Are we all there on the other side of the screen? Nobody? Yeah. Oh, yes, Livia. Go ahead. Uh, I'll just make a try. Um, sure, sure. Go ahead. It seems like uh, you feel um, uh, uh, you feel concerned about going to um, uh, going uh, going for a doctor visit. Um, um good you do, you're doing well you're doing well um, now you want to reframe it uh -huh. uh, do you think uh, uh actually uh making a visit can make you feel better or uh uh or um something like uh, yeah i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> good job good job i, I think you you did it, it you tried you tried that's good that's good anybody else like to try Okay, so here's here's what you could say. You could say something like, uh, you know, it sounds that you're you're really nervous um, and and can be really frightening. And I, I do see that those needles and that smell, that environment can be extremely uh, put, putting off, isn't it? Um, I'm I'm just wondering, what do you think would uh, once you finished it, once you've had your medical procedure, what do you see? How would you see? it is being, uh, um, once it's done, what's beneficial? What do you think would be beneficial? Right, so what are you doing? You're helping them, you're, you're helping them see, okay, once I finish my procedure, then maybe I'll feel better. Um, I, you know, I, I, I know I can feel better. So you have got back on that feeling better part of it, right? So you, you um, empathize that it is difficult, it is hard, um, yet, I'm wondering, how, how would it be after your medical procedure? What would you feel after your medical procedure? What would you experience after your medical procedure? And then she may say, that, so then you could ask, uh, so would the medical procedure be worth it? You know, so that's, that's something that you can, you can try. I think Jafina said, I understand that it's frightening, but I believe, as you mentioned, it makes you feel better, and I hope that makes you feel happy. OK, right. So that's, again, a, a reflecting thing. Now let's look at logical consequences. So something like, like what you could ask of is, um, you know, again, again, empathizing is very important. I do see that the medical procedure makes it difficult for you. It's, it must be quite frightening. Uh, however, what have you seen as the, as the uh, positives of having the procedure so you are getting them to bring about the positive logical consequences to it okay and then maybe you could once you've done that saying okay as against that what could happen if you don't take the medical procedure so you get getting the other side of it so then you're saying okay which of them do you think is a, is a better state for you so i said yeah maybe i think it's better to feel better rather than feel worse so you're there itself you are helping them to rebuild that separately okay 
All right, let's look at another example. Uh, this is for feedback and self-disclosure, OK? So last week, I used the techniques we discussed on how to control my anger by taking time out. But this morning, I completely lost it and screamed and shouted at my mother. This is just hopeless. OK, what influencing skills can you use? One, feedback, either feedback or self-disclosure. Come on, this, I think, is a little bit more easier. <clears throat> Would Would like you to change try. the slide or oh, I didn't change the slide. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So which, which, um, yeah. So here's the the two skills, right? Feedback or self disclosure. What what can you say? What can you? What of the two? Uh, you could use any of the two, either feedback or self disclosure. Somebody would like to try? <clears throat> Anybody? I'll just try. Hmm. Um, you feel uh, upset <clears throat> um, that uh, uh, you um, again uh, lost your temper at your mo mother, uh, but um, I think you did a great job uh, by uh, trying out those techniques that we had discussed. Uh, um, keep trying on something okay. like that. <laughs> good, good, very good. Good, Divya. Thank you so much. Yeah. So we could also say something like, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure it's really frustrating for you to be a, to have lost your, uh, uh, lost your temper on your mother this morning, um, you know. But I, I really want to appreciate the fact that the last six days you were able to hold it. So again, I'm focusing on something that she could do, and uh, you know, I really want to focus on. Uh, on the last six days that you were able to hold it. What have you learned about yourself that, you know, out of the last seven days, six out of seven you were able to do? Or maybe it's just one out of seven, okay? Suppose she says, the last seven days I didn't do it, only this one. So I'd say out of that seven, you were able to manage manage to work on something today. So it, it gives a sense of a feedback that, you know, you're doing well. It's okay, you're, you're, you're doing well. Or for self-disclosure, it's something like, I can imagine how frustrating it is. You know, I found myself also just losing it with my so-and-so. And it can be really, really frustrating. So that that's as much as self-disclosure. I may not say anything more, but just help them encourage that. How can we keep moving on? OK? All right? OK, good. Good, good. Thank you so much, Divya, for, for that. All right, we'll move on to the last part of it. It is how do we initiate action. So we've come to that place where we want our counselees to move from that place of um, uh, exploring to that place on uh, understanding and now moving them into a place of action. How do we get them to work through into, into action? So here, the goals that you would have is to help them develop strategies for accomplishing that specific goal. That's what it is. You know, you are going to work with them to find ways, alternative op options, strategies to accomplish the goal that they would want. Either it's working, uh, you know, getting uh, giving up alcohol or, uh, you know, working on their anger or developing a relationship, whatever, whatever they are looking at. Second is to help them find strategies that fit them best and to formulate those plans and to work about certain ways of how you're going to have a plan. So I've just taken uh, an example of a couple, a married couple who's come to you for help. Their daughter has decided to marry someone out of their faith. And she's just broken the news uh, only a day ago when the parents brought the proposal of a family friend's son who is also well known to her. So the parents are really upset at that decision. 
and they've come to you for help. So this is just an example that I would want to bring up and maybe look at ways of how we can help to resolve this. Okay, generally, if I would do this as a role play, but but here we, I, I guess we may not be able to do that. So what is the first task? Now remember, we've come all that way and we are at the point of initiating the actions. So what is strategy? It is uh, the art of finding or identifying or helping your counseling to choose realistic courses of action in order to achieve their goal. And uh, even uh, uh, and doing so maybe even under those adverse conditions, OK? There may be difficult situations. So what, what are you doing is, what you're, what you're helping them doing is find the kind of actions that will help them get what they want or what they need. You may need to uh, work alongside with them to brainstorm so that they can begin to think. And also, you can also suggest alternatives. You suggest certain things. And that's where you use something that we call as the prompt and fade technique. So the here as a counselor, I may say, you know, here are some possibilities. So I'm, I'm, I'm adding, I'm saying some possibilities. Let's review them and see whether any of them makes any sense to you, um, or we could suggest something else. Or we can say, here are some of the things that people with this kind of a problem situation generally have tried. How does that sound to you? So that's a prompting. Okay, That's where you prompt. You fade by uh, the, the fading part of that technique is by, by, by not giving, not keeping it from being the advice giving. OK, it must they must see <coughs> they must see that, OK, there are 10 of these strategies and I can choose one from them and I can commit to them. So you may you may suggest it, but it won't be that. OK, I think this is what you should be doing. You don't come into that place of a position. OK, so here in Sam and uh, Sarika's case, what you're doing is maybe they come up with many strategies. One is they give it time or they talk to Lena, their child as a couple, or they talk to the individually, they talk to the boy. They may ask Sarika's sister to talk to Lena. They may ask their pastor to talk to Lena. So there are four or five action points that they have, the strategies that they have decided to do. Okay. So maybe their goal here is to convince their daughter that she needs to rethink her decision. That's the goal that Sam and Sarika has come to you. And you're helping them to find or brainstorm certain ideas. OK, now from here, you would go in to also look for social support. Who can engage alongside with them? So who are the individuals who might help them achieve their goal? OK, so that's what that's what basically that you are looking looking at. Who who else can help you? in this situation. So sometimes you will have two categories of counselees, those who have a very, very poor social life and those who are not using their social support effectively. OK, but I think as you keep pressing in, <clears throat> there may be one or two people that they may be able to bring up in their list to help you to understand how, uh, what kind of support that they could come up, come up with this. So the questions that you ask in this kind of uh, issue when you're enlisting support is who might help you to do this? Who's going to challenge you when you want to give up? With whom can you share these concerns? Who's going to give you a pat on the back when you accomplish your goal? So this, in all of this, what you are doing is increasing the, the, <clears throat> the hope ability of the situation, right? It's like you say, who's going to give you a pat on the back when you accomplish your goal? Maybe it's it's a it's a buddy that they will want to take in in order to initiate the action because that really helps them to move forward with the situation. Like in Sarik, Sam and Sarika's case, it was the Sarika's sister who was close to the family that they've enlisted, or the pastor who they've enlisted. Okay, uh, moving on. The second task is to help them <coughs> choose the right strategies help them to figure out what is the best way to go so the strategy that they choose uh, when they choose it will fit their situation it will fit their resources it will fit their personality it will fit their preferences and that's what you are getting them to do so these strategies should basically be specific 
That is, it, it should be specific to drive that behavior. It should be substantiated. That is, it should challenge your counselee's resources when actually achieving the goal. It should be realistic. It should be keeping with the values of your counselee. All right. So that's when, when the strategies are being formulated, you look at these aspects of it. It should be specific. It should challenge the resources of the counselee. It should be realistic. And it should keep with the values of your uh, of your uh, counsel counselor counseling. Okay, so here uh, with Sam and Sarika's case, you know they they first of their options was they wanted to give it time. So then you are looking at how much time. What is the pros and cons of that time? Maybe then next one was talking to Lena or individually or as a couple. Now these are probably some things that they have they have. Uh, looked at and you're trying to help them see which would be the best fit strategy for their condition. So each of those five points over here, they will look at the pros and the cons of it to try and figure out what exactly can help them through that through that situation. Okay. The next one is to help them formulate those viable plans. And so once they have decided Uh, I'm sorry, I think we got cut off. Uh, was I gone long? I think just uh, two, three minutes now. Just two, three minutes. Okay, okay. 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 Sorry. sorry. All right. So um, just going back to uh, is, is the screen on? Isn't? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> yeah, so just to go back. When, when they are formulating those plans, when they've come to those plans, you're helping them with discipline, you're helping them through any kind of emotional overwhelm there is, and also to help them if they need to have other kind of strategies to deal with that specific issue. You're going to continue to helping them to do that. Okay. Um, now, remember when you're looking at, um, at, at, in, at, at these plans, remember you you're also giving you also need to give them an opportunity to evaluate how realistic these goals may be sometimes uh, they may not be aware of how whether they are a realistic goal or not okay so you're you're going to provide that opportunity help them think about that next you will also make them aware of the resources they will need to implement that strategy like for example in uh, the Sam and Sarika's case, maybe they want to uh, talk to their, their pastor, which means that, which means you know they may need to discuss all of this. So that may be a resource. Do they have the time to do that? Uh, do they uh, does does the pastor have the time? So you're making them aware of the resources and also helping them uncover any kind of obstacles that could come about in making them accomplish such and such a goal. So that's something again that you will. Uh, you will need to work with them. Now, even as you're working through this, uh, all of this, remember that there aren't any formulas. Okay. Um, sometimes you just have to uh, have to let the Holy Spirit work with their needs, 
their sense and, and the way that they need to go through that. Okay, uh, When you are working with them, you may be able in your discussion with them outline you know, huge detailed plans. But even if certain things don't go that it, it does, remember there is there is the power of the Holy Spirit that works up through and I've seen that happen way so often, even even in, in things we've uh, you know I, when I've worked with people. So here, let's say Sam and Sarika, the strategy that they have chosen is to talk to Lena. So their plans is, you know, they will maybe pray together, talk it over as a couple, and then talk it over with their pastor. So this is this is how they would have probably planned to do that. So even as they have decided to do that, what you are also doing is to work back with them in looking at each of these goals that they, or each of these smaller goals that they have formed to see the pros and cons of it. Um, and as they continue, they may say, okay, they will tell Lena that they would like to talk to her and fix a time and place, pray together as a family before starting the conversation, stay calm during the conversation, focus on understanding her point of view, share our beliefs. So this is a certain plan that this couple may have may have come about. Okay. So once once they have come with the plan, the next is to implement. And, and it and every as as every implementation as every plan has there is um, uh, there is a discipline in being able to do that okay uh, so being able to stay that course which they have decided okay and also self control self control is of course in the way that the that 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 those eight or seven plans which i showed you in the previous slide how they would not want to jump uh jump away from one because maybe the situation or the the issues are not conducive you also look you just don't look at strategy and tactics but you also look at uh, logistics that is the art of being able to provide the right resources needed to plan in a timely way so maybe logistics is finding the right time to talk to lena maybe letting her know well in advance preparing a day where they could all sit together, maybe planning a meal outside. So there are certain logistics as you're doing it. So when you're doing this, you're actually creating a kind of a blueprint on how they are going to build action. So the more details you get into, you get into really tiny details. It makes the action uh, uh, alive for your counseling. And that's what you are intending to do through that. Okay. Uh, so here, yeah. so Sam and Sarika, the self-control is to stay calm during the entire conversation and uh, be able to adapt. What if Lena refuses to talk? What if during the conversation Lena blows up? So these are some of the things that you work alongside with them to figure out. And that's what I said, being able to look into um, smaller, uh, significant details as they as they come across that. Okay. Um, what are their resources? The internal resources is to rely on the Holy Spirit and trusting in God's will for Lena. So that even as you are initiating that action, you are bringing them up to a place and say, this is all that we can do. There may be other external uh, resources which, which you may need. You're working alongside them to work through. Okay. Next is to uh, you evaluate. So you evaluate. Sorry, I think I skipped a slide. Just a minute. Okay, so to evaluate what are you doing once something has happened, you review those plans, you help with modifications and look at a way of how um, you're, you're actually teaching them to take responsibilities for themselves. That is what is self-evaluation. You are looking back into the way that they've handled things so that um, you know where they are at the part of resolving a certain problem okay um, and lastly is to uh, is is for feedback is to be able to give them a confirmatory feedback or any kind of a corrective feedback and generally feedback should be like let's say they come back either they've done well or they haven't you know they've done what they wanted to do or they haven't done so here's where you're giving them either a confirmatory feedback 
that you know hey good job well done you know things went as per as per what you had decided or a corrective feedback a corrective feedback you do it in the spirit of caring you're doing it um, helping them see that mistakes are okay and it's an opportunity for better growth uh, corrective feedback should come concretely specifically and very briefly it should more focus on the behavior than on the personality and it should uh, provide feedback in smaller doses rather than uh, something that is that's extensively um, corrective right so it, it should be done with a lot of um, uh, care all right okay um, now since we've wrapped this entire thing up okay I'm, I'm not going through that this is where uh, this is where we're going to put everything together, what we've learned over the last couple of weeks. We're going to add everything together. So when we've looked at the counseling model, we spoke about the counseling model as um, uh, exploratory, uh, self-exploratory, understanding and action. Now, what this chart depicts here is the various stages that both the counselor as well as the counselee pass through during this entire uh, counselling process. What it, uh, so first and foremost, it shows the relationship between the attitudes and skills of the counsellor and the learning process of the counsellee. Here, the attitudes, as we had spoken about, uh, which are adopted, are um, empathy, unconditional positive regard, and genuineness. Okay? Now, uh, to understand this, okay. So, what do we? What, what does this show you? Now, during the initial stage, the attending skills of the counselor, the attending skills of the counselor, affect the involvement of the counselee in the process. So, when you as a counselor attend, you see the arrow coming down. That's when the counselee gets involved in the counseling process. Once the counselee is involved, the next stage begins, which is the responding. OK, the responding skills of the counsellor, what does that do? It stimulates the self-exploratory stage in the counselling. Now, the deepening self-exploration enables the counselling process to pass on to the uh, to the next level, which is the personalizing stage. The personalizing skills of the counselor will stimulate the self-understanding of the counseling. All right? And the clear understanding makes it possible for the process to move to the initiating action, to, to for them to initiate action and once that action is done that's when feedback and evaluation takes place okay i hope this is clear so let me just explain this again uh, it, it is the arrows that you follow that when you attend the attending skills of the counselor will affect the involvement of the counseling so everything that you see in the bottom is the learning process of the counselee. Everything that you see on top is the skills of the counsellor. So the, in, the attending skills of the counsellor will affect how the way the counsellee gets involved. Once the counsellee is involved, it moves to the next stage where the responding skills of the counsellor will begin to stimulate the self-exploration. This can happen over and over and over and over and over again many times. This level of deepening of self-exploration will enable the counseling process to move to the personalizing stage. And the personalizing skills of the counselor will stimulate the self-understanding of the counseling. And this understanding makes it possible for the counselor to help them move into the initiating stage, where the counselee will take the relevant action steps for the problem. And then it ends with <clears throat> a feedback as well as an evaluation. OK, I hope over the last what we've been talking about over the last, I think, uh, four or five to six weeks is spoken about in this entire 
slide, which shows that all of this work hand in hand together, work hand in hand um, uh, to move it from one process into the other. OK? All right. Any questions up until here? By, uh, with this, we finish our counseling skills. We will be moving into specific uh, different stages uh, different areas of counseling uh, that that may be needed for us as people who are going to work with uh, a set of believers with 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 regular people you know with, with different stages and issues in life so from with this we end our counseling skills any thoughts any questions <coughs> I hope this has given you, uh, you know, a, a framework. It's given you um, uh, a summary, a comprehensive summary of how this entire thing works. So I know it, it seems a lot cluttered. There are too many things going in. But when you begin to start, when you begin the process, it will, it, it will pan into one into the other. No questions? Is everybody stumped? No questions. <laughs> OK. All right. So let's just close with a word of prayer. And uh, yeah. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, God, for um, for so many things, God, that's uh, that's been running in class over the last couple of weeks. God, you are the giver of all wisdom and knowledge. And I just pray for each one of us, Lord, here in this call and who's going to view this. God, that you will lead us and guide us, Lord, for those of us who may want to pursue this further into deeper understanding. I pray that you open up avenues, opportunities where we can use some of these skills, use this with, Lord, the Spirit's wisdom and knowledge. Thank you, God, for teaching us. Uh, uh, through these different ways of how to connect and how to work with people. Most of all, God, we rely on you as our, as our greatest counselor, the one who, who gives us the right words, the right uh, uh, things to say. Father, we pray, Lord, that uh, you will empower us, God, to be sensitive, to be loving, to be empathetic, to be, uh, to be non-judgmental, but yet, Father, to speak and to... Uh, help people with the truth. Thank you that you you work with each one of us, Lord. We pray that uh, you will minister to us uh, in our deepest needs, God, and give us and help us to be in a place of receiving from you, so that we can give unto others. Be with us through the week till we meet again. We ask God that uh, you will you will empower us, you will equip us, you will strengthen us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. God bless. We'll meet you next week. Thank you.